welcome one and all and thanks again to the uh organizers of this event for having me the theme of my presentation is imagine act thrive we live in a time of great challenges and even greater opportunities climate change environmental degradation and social inequality are just some of the issues that we face what if I told you that there's a movement that inspires hope and offers solutions for a better world? That's what Solarpunk is all about. Though it began in the early 2010s as a spin-off of Cyberpunk, I believe Solarpunk has evolved beyond that. Solarpunk is not just a genre of science fiction or visual aesthetic. It explores the intersection between humanity, nature, and technology. It has the potential, already partially realized, to rally a real movement for change around the world, composed of artists, writers, designers, activists, and thinkers of every background, with his vision of a future that's green, sustainable, and just. I mean, I'm preaching to the choir here, right? I'm sure most of you, having signed up for a solar phone conference, have some passing familiarity with the concept. But maybe some of you don't know me. And uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Andrew Sage. And I run the YouTube channel, Andrewism, with the aim of learning and exploring as much as possible. Growing up in Trinidad, where I still live to this day, I spent much of my childhood dreaming of a world with superheroes, robots, and flying cars. My dreams have evolved over time, although I do hope my latent X gene will activate at some point. But I never let go of that imaginative spirit. So when I discovered Solar Punk, I found a channel for that imagination. I found a way to turn that imagination into action in the here and now, for a thriving future. Around the same time that I discovered solar pump, I also discovered anarchism. Anarchism very quickly became the foundation upon which my solar punk ideas and desires would be realized. My solar punk ideals became shaped more and more by my anarchist philosophy and vice versa. And the this is an anarchist conference, so we have anarchists in the audience. And I'd like to give a brief overview of the concept. Anarchism is the belief that rulership should not exist. It is a rejection of that dichotomy between rulers and ruled. It is a rejection of the hierarchies of old and of today, of capitalism, of statism, of patriarchy, of white supremacy, of colonialism, and more. It is the ongoing practice of flattening hierarchies. But beyond rejecting what is, anarchists dare to imagine what if. As in, what if we organize a society and institutions through horizontal cooperation, free association, and mutual aid? And what if we move with the intention of seeing such a society come into fruition? Anarchic methods have proliferated in some forms prior to capitalism, during the period of the Paris Commune, during the Spanish Civil War, after the Zapatistas Revolution, and in the social movements of today, particularly post occupy Often called democracy without a state, anarchism aims to build voluntary, localized, and cooperative institutions organized from the bottom up through decentralized networks and run via processes of participatory democracy and self-management. All projects and methods must thus reflect those aims. In, in fact, rather than viewing anarchism as an end goal far out of reach, it's best to view anarchism as a method, a form of change maker. And in viewing it as a method, we can see that we live in an era of grassroots and decentralized social movements. In fact, I would venture to say that most social movements in the present day, as recognized by anarchist anthropologist David Graeber, rest in peace, are structured through horizontal networks of cooperation rather than top-down hierarchies, even if they don't call themselves anarchists. Solarpunk has long attracted anarchists and aided in the creation of new ones becomes the because the aims of both are so easily aligned. Few imagine a world of today's institutions and politics when they think of their solar punk ideal, and that's for good reason. The state has provided, has proven itself incapable of doing what is necessary to curtail climate change. And worse yet, when it does act, its projects may not go far enough, or they fail to engage those that need most to succeed. Meanwhile, capitalism works hand in hand with the state to limit any major changes from taking place and ensure its continued and ravenous pursuit of extractive economic growth. But something needs to change. 
long after I discovered sort of punk and fully ventured into my exploration of anarchism, I created my YouTube channel, where I now explore a range of radical topics from anarchism to decolonization to youth liberation to library economies to social revolution and to, of course, sort of punk. Much of my channel is dedicated to exploring this need for change and how we can bring it about. Much of my channel aligned to the very essence of this inaugural sort of punk conference, imagine, act, thrive. So again, I'm truly grateful for the opportunity to share a few words about a subject I'm so passionate about. I wanna again give a quick shout out and thanks to all the organizers whose labor went into making this event possible. And without further ado, dive right in to the power of imagination. It is an unfortunate reality that many people's imaginations have atrophied severely as a consequence of living under the system, so we do. Capitalism, statism, patriarchy, colonialism, and white supremacy co-opt, strangle, corrupt, and starve our imaginations. These systems limit our ability to think outside of them, to think beyond them, to imagine something different. The education system seems intent on stripping out the creativity and freedom found in every child and instilling a sense of meek obedience and powerlessness in the face of authority. Our education system has not been built to nurture whole persons. Some children these days don't even have an outside to play in where they could create their own worlds and games and stories. But such freedom to roam is crucial for their psychological well-being. Freedom, and especially the freedom to play, is, an e is as essential for the potential development of children as learning to speak or to walk. Without it, we're left with stunted and traumatized adults. Despite living in the age of unprecedented access to information, I don't believe we have truly taken advantage of its potential. In fact, this technology has been weaponized to steal our attention, to drain our energy, and to sell our data. We are constantly bombarded with information, with advertisements, with attempts to seize our attention, and how many of us fight a daily battle distraction, one that previous generations did not have to contend with in the same way. If we do not break free of these systems here and now, and recognize the critical importance of imagination in cultivating empathy, creating better lives and envisioning a positive future, envisioning and enacting a positive future, we will forever remain trapped in this disastrous dystopia. We need to break free. Our very cognitive ability may even decline in response to the rise in global CO2 concentrations and the health of our hippocampus, the HQ of our imaginations, may perish in response to the increase in cortisol, the stress hormone, triggered by late stage capitalism. For the task of revitalizing our imaginations, nature can and should guide us. After all, the environment we evolved in cultivates our imaginations in the first place. Our first stories were based on the things we experienced and imagined we could experience. I often reference the one line, when we think about you know, the depth of our love, as the famous song goes, it's, it's like the ocean, you know? Human creativity, human language, and human thought are tied to the natural world. And we need to maintain the diversity of that natural world in order to retain that humanity. We must resist the monotonies, monopolies, and monocultures that strip our world of that palette of possibilities before it is too late. Because we won't know what we've missed until it's gone. All imaginations are further fed by the power of art and its stories. Which is why I believe Soul Punk's literary roots should be retained even as it evolves beyond the realm of text and artwork. A lot of my channel has been focused primarily on the political and practical dimensions of Soul Punk, but that doesn't mean that I disregard its potency in the fictional space. Although facts about climate change may be enough to change our may not be enough to change our society, a powerful story can. We are storytellers, and stories are potent. Stories can motivate a range of social movements. They do to this day, they influence far more politics than you might think. The stories we tell ourselves about the end of history, or of space exploration, or of the second coming, 
these stories shape how people behave in their day-to-day -day lives, how they engage with politics, how they view the economy, how they view their lives and their futures. So the punk rightfully argues that we cannot see the domain of our imagination, of our stories, to dystopia. We cannot resign ourselves to the continued domination of first nature by second nature. For those unaware, first nature refers to the natural world and its ecological systems, which have evolved over millions of years. Second nature refers to the social world and the systems of human organizations, such as culture, politics, and economics that have been constructed by humans over time. We need our imagination in order to reach third nature, as conceptualized by social ecologist Murray Butcher. Third nature refers to the synthesis of first and second nature, where human societies integrate with the natural world in a sustainable and harmonious way, which involves the creation of ecological communities that are based on principles of decentralization, mutual aid, and ecological balance. The key to achieving third nature is the imagining and development of a new social and political consciousness that is rooted in ecological values. And if you're still having trouble grasping just how vital imagination is in fueling solar bunk change, look at it through the lens of the imagination sundial, courtesy Rob Hopkins and Rob Shorten. It's split into space, place, practices, and paths, and we begin with space. Imagination is rooted in space. Our fast-paced and stressful lives often hinder our capacity for imagination. Creating space is a way to slow down, to connect with others and with nature, and to rekindle our imaginative potential. We need to create mental, emotional, and temporal space to imagine more, to do more, and to act more. This is the internal work that is necessary for solar box success. That means understanding the self, it means connecting with others. It means making room to make mistakes. It means flowing down so that we can observe ourselves, others, and the world around us. It means being kinder to ourselves as we dare to imagine. The more we cultivate space, the more our imagination thrives. Making space in our lives is a deliberate process that requires recognizing that imagination is a function of privilege. It is difficult to imagine a more beautiful life when one's basic needs are not met, when we are under stress or under trauma, and the way that this system is set up, people don't have space to imagine by design. With even minor successes that we could potentially make in worker struggles, such as in shorter work weeks or shorter work hours, we can free up space in our minds and in our lives to foster our imaginations and to work on our solutions. Just as mental and emotional space is important for the well being of an individual, place is crucial for the health of a community's mind and soul. These are places where people can reside and delight without the obligation to purchase or pay for anything. Think in libraries, parks, community centers. These are the places that encourage connection, creativity, cooperation, and inclusivity to a diverse range of people. Place involves creating and transforming places that allow us to bring together our imaginations, organize collective, collectively, and implement the worlds we want to see. Establishing neighborhood commons, from car-free streets to shared gardens, to community events and ceremonies that can bring people together. Places can be virtual, much like this Sorbonne conference, or physical, like block meetings, maker spaces, skill shares, and libraries of things. The best places are those that leave you the transformed sense of what the future might hold, even if only slightly. However, the number of these non-commercial spaces have dwindled as public commons have become privatized. If we want to rebuild our collective imagination, we must begin by reclaiming and reconstructing the commons at all levels of community from the very streets we walk upon, to the central civic spaces, to the natural habitats that surround us. So the punk should not be left to the realm of thought or imagination. We need action and places for that action. 
I think there are great examples of place all over the world. But one that frequently catches my attention has been the Better Block movement, which is all about urban, grassroots, bottom-up placemaking. The Better Block movement was started by a group of neighbors who wanted to create a vibrant public space in their city, but found that old city ordinances prevented them from doing so. So they decided to break the rules and take over their block for a weekend, creating bike lanes, pop-up food markets, and a beer garden. This experiment, called the Better Block, encouraged community brainstorming and learning. The movement has since spread to cities around the world, and it encapsulates exactly the kind of imagining translated into direct action that the solar punk movement needs. We can take a place people know well and pass every day and give it a makeover so that it becomes an immersive, living, breathing expression of what a low carbon, more just future would be like to actually live it. The concept of practices is an important one in the context of cultivated imagination and creativity. While space and place provide the foundation for imagination to take root, it is through practices that we truly unleash our creativity and tap into our imaginative potential. Practices involve connecting us with each other and changing our frame of possibilities. One of the key aspects of practices is that they allow us to break down the internal constraints and societal norms that often hold us back from imagining and creating new things. Whether it's through play, making, or storytelling, practices can create bridges between the real and the imagined, the known and the unknown. They help us to enter into a liminal space where we can let go of our preconceived notions and begin to see things in a new way. In addition to breaking down barriers to creativity, practices also help us to cultivate mental and emotional space. They can provide a sense of relaxation and playfulness that allows us to let go of stress and anxiety, open up new pathways for imaginative thinking. Some practices, such as Puma Blitzes, can even create physical places in the process providing a tangible manifestation of the imaginative potential that has been unlocked. Puma Blitzes, for those who don't know, are single day or over a weekend uh, events in which a uh, certain space, such as a person's backyard, is transformed into a haven of permaculture design uh, through the collaborative efforts of the surrounding neighbors, surrounding community, and anyone who wants to contribute to seeing a transformation like that take place. I have a video about it on my channel for those seeking more information on it. Through these practices, through Puma Blitzes, through various sit-downs and organization strategies, through storytelling, through play, through making, we can create new places, new stories, and new ways of being in the world. We don't need to limit our practices to what's immediately around us. International solidarity allows us to come together and share stories and key studies of what's possible for everyday people committed to change all over the world. Drawn from the world of transition towns, for example, and inspired by the strategies and tactics of liberatory projects from Brazil to Mexico to India. But beyond just learning about these stories, practices empower us to put them into action engaging our hands and minds in the practice of transformation. Celebrating our successes together and learning from our failures to understand our limitations and thrive within them. Practicing an expanded recognition of all of our possibilities. Lastly, pacts are about making agreements to get things done. Pacts are about action. The concept of pacts as a catalyst for imagination and action is rooted in the understanding that change and transformation are more likely to happen when different actors work together towards a common goal. In many cases, the imagination of people and communities is not lacking per se, but rather the mechanisms and resources to turn these ideas into reality. And this is where pacts come in. I can recall many instances in which I have spoken to people just on the street, you know, waiting for a taxi, waiting for a bus, uh, walking on the road in a taxi, in a bus, um, 
chatting with students, chatting with teachers, touch, chatting with people of all sorts of backgrounds. <laughs> they have ideas and they have ideas to make these changes uh, take place, but they don't know how to put it into practice. They have the ideas in their head, they don't know how to translate them to reality, how to reach out to other people and to work with other people to turn it into reality. And so that's where PACs come in. PACs are essentially agreements between multiple actors that recognize the importance of working together to achieve a shared vision. These include, these actors can include students and neighbors and cooperatives and unions and more. And by working collaboratively, the strengths of each actor can be combined to achieve a transformative potential that may not be possible through individual efforts. The role of the catalyst is crucial in the formation of PACs. This can be an individual or an organization that takes on the responsibility of inviting, convening, and offering the initial vision. The catalyst creates a space for collaboration and helps to build the relationships needed to bring different actors together to imagine collectively and to tell their stories about their environment and their future. You can ask yourself, are you willing, are you able to take on that role of being a catalyst in your local context? Packs can be made on any level, from small scale community initiatives to large scale national or international efforts. We need PACs to provide a mechanism for turning ideas into action and in meeting the imagination halfway. With all this talk of imagination and action, it should be obvious that we truly need to ramp up our action in the face of climate change and environmental degradation. The scientific consensus has been clear. Our current organization of the economy and its reliance on the burden of fossil fuels for continuous economic growth are causing global temperatures to rise at an unprecedented rate. We're seeing frequently and increasingly severe weather events, such as with deadly wildfires in the West United States and Australia, record-breaking heat waves across Europe, flooding and landslides affecting millions of people across Africa, severe flooding affecting 30 million people, for example, in the Henan province in China, cyclones affecting 50 million people in India and Bangladesh. We're seeing rising sea levels, islands like Tuvalu in the Pacific are already starting to disappear, and coastal cities like Jakarta, Indonesia, which is already starting to sink, are now having it worse thanks to rising tides. I was seeing ecological devastation, such as the continued destruction of the Amazon rainforest, the expansion of the Sahara Desert, and the business as usual oil spills that decimate marine environments. As temperatures continue to rise, the consequences will only become more severe, potentially compounding catastrophes for human societies and the natural world. We are running out of time. Some even argue that we have run out of time. Even remaining below 1.5 degrees Celsius rise now seems out of reach, as we've already triggered certain feedback loops. I am of the belief that no matter how far we've slipped into disaster, there is still much to be done to mitigate these issues. I've been inspired by the quick turnaround seen under lockdown and the speed at which certain rewilding efforts have enabled the recovery of local ecosystems. We are still capable of helping the world heal, of retaking our position as its helpers instead of its harmers. There are Solopunk solutions. Solopunk posits many ways for us to implement solutions in response to these issues. In food systems, Solopunk prioritizes local, organic, and sustainable food production and distribution supporting community gardens, farmers markets, and local food co-ops, as well as reducing food waste and promoting plant-based diets. Solopunk in architecture advocates creating buildings that are sustainable, energy efficient, and aesthetically pleasing, which can involve using passive solar design techniques to maximize natural light and heat, incorporating green roofs and living walls to improve air quality and reduce heat island effects, 
and utilizing locally sourced and recycled building materials. Solar Punk in fashion seeks to reduce waste, reduce plastics, reduce emissions, and reduce water usage in the production, distribution, and use of clothing. It involves using sustainable ethical materials such as organic cotton, recycled polyester, cactus leather, and banana silk, while designing clothes that are durable, modular, and repairable. So the Punk in urban planning seeks to create and cultivate more green spaces, reduce food and plastic waste in urban environments, and promote sustainable transportation options, such as biking, walking, and public transportation, which can be achieved through both municipal activism and direct action to take control of our streets and our cities. Solarpunk in community can involve working to build climate resilience by creating community-led disaster preparedness plans and response teams, building resilient infrastructure, and promoting biodiversity through actions such as planting native species and creating rain gardens and green roofs. Solarpunk in energy production seeks to help us meet some of our energy needs through renewable sources like solar, wind, and hydropower, while also trying to reduce energy consumption as a whole by dismantling the energy sucking, growth demanding behemoth of industrial capitalism. However, on the flip side, Solarpunk needs climate justice. And climate justice is incompatible with the exploitative and extractive nature of rare earth mineral mining, which is a requirement for many of our modern technologies, including renewable energy. Even though these technologies have clear benefits, let's not get caught up. The mining of materials needed to make them can lead to deforestation, pollution of water sources, and the displacement and enslavement of indigenous communities, particularly in Africa, South Asia, and South America. Solar punk solutions are potent, but they are not a panacea. They can offer more positive alternative to our current systems, but we can't blindly embrace them. They still come with their own set of challenges that can't simply be brushed aside. These action-oriented solutions are powerful, but disconnected. I spoke about doing all sorts of different things, community disaster preparedness plans, building resilient infrastructure, biking and walking, promoting sustainable transportation, you know, renewable fashion, all these ideas are cool, but they're disconnected. We need a plan. We need a plan of action, a coordinated strategy of action to oppose and action to propose. Acts of confrontation, non-cooperation, and prefiguration to establish the changes necessary to, for a solar punk revolution. And I'll get into what those terms mean. Confrontation involves actions like protests, obstructions, occupations, expropriations, sabotage, and more. Protests are a common form of confrontation, as seen with the Friday's Future Movement, often involving large groups of people gathering in public spaces to raise awareness of an issue and demand action from those in power or implement it themselves through direct action. Protests have been a powerful tool throughout history but they're not enough to see the drastic changes we need to see. Obstruction can take many forms, such as blockades of roads or pipelines or entrances to facilities to physically prevent harmful activities from taking place. That involves putting our own bodies on the line to see the world that we want to see. Occupations involve occupying a space such as a building or a piece of land, to draw attention to an issue or to prevent harmful activities from continuing. Expropriation involves the taking of property, such as land or resources, without compensation, usually as a means of stopping harmful activities or as a way of opening space to new possibilities. Reclaiming stolen land by Indigenous communities is part of that, as it's developing community land trusts to take control of vacant lots within our communities and develop them through community-led initiatives. Sabotage involves intentionally damaging or disrupting infrastructure or equipment used in environmentally destructive practices with the goal of halting or slowing down such activities. The systems, governments, corporations, and individuals responsible for the mess that is climate change and the terror that is environmental destruction 
must be confronted head on and their actions aborted to the fullest extent for the sake of our survival and the sake of the survival of our hope for a Surapunk world. We need confrontation. And on the flip side, we need non-cooperation, which involves actions like labor strikes, boycotts, student strikes, debt strikes, mutiny, and more. The action necessary to disrupt the system from within and prevent it from functioning the way the powers that be wanted to. Labor strikes, for example, involve workers collectively refusing to work until their demands are met. These demands can range from better wages to workers' control, and strikes can take many forms, from union organized to wildcat, from general across industries to industry or company specific. Similarly, boycotts involve consumers refusing to purchase goods or services from companies that engage in unethical or harmful practices, such as those that contribute to environmental, dest environmental destruction or labor exploitation. And personally, boycotts are a, a subject that is a bit contentious because I believe that the era of boycotts has in some ways passed. I'm not saying that they are entirely ineffective, but I do fear that the multi multinational nature of the corporations of today has made it difficult or time ineffective to coordinate such boycott action. However, that's not to say that it's impossible or that we should try. Student strikes are a form of non-cooperation where students collectively refuse to attend classes or engage in educational activities until certain demands are met, such as the removal of discriminatory policies change in their curriculum or divestment from fossil fuels. Debt strikes involve debtors collectively refusing to pay back their loans as a means of challenging the system of debt that often keeps people in cycles of poverty. Rent strikes involve tenants collectively refusing to pay rent in protest of poor living conditions or unjust rent increases. And tax strikes involve citizens collectively refusing to pay taxes as a means of protesting wars, government policies, or other government actions. All of these acts of non-cooperation are based on the recognition that we hold the power, and that if we can realize it, we can change things. If we can refuse to let this world go to ruin for the sake of profit, if we can seize power over our society and our destiny, we can bring about that sort of our future. But these oppositional actions are fragile in isolation. They are not enough. It is good that we struggle so passionately to fight for the next world, that we fight so hard to defend Mother Nature, but if we take on these actions to oppose without anything to back it up, without anything to fall back on, without any place of refuge or safety, we're spinning on top of mud. It is an exercise, I believe, in futility, righteous futility, but futility nonetheless. It is not enough to oppose. We need to propose. We need to actively build alternatives, alternatives that are worthy of defending. And that's where prefiguration comes in. Rather than solely focusing on protesting and resisting existing structures, prefigurative actions prioritize creating alternatives that embody the values and principles we want to see in society. The concept of prefigurative politics refers to the idea that the way in which we organize and behave in pursuit of our goals should reflect the values and principles that we seek to achieve. In other words, the ends should justify the means. That means that groups should strive to embody the kind of society or world that they want to see in the process of working towards that goal. Preferring to politics is essential to both soul punk and anarchism for good reason. Without it, we can end up strengthening or recreating the very systems we want to do away with. Prefiguration involves many of the actions I've already described earlier. Building cooperatives for workers that prioritize shared ownership, equitable decision making, and mutual support. And building housing cooperatives that can provide an alternative to the profit driven real estate market and help create affordable, community oriented living spaces. 
creating popular assemblies and reclaiming the commons to provide a space for people to come together, discuss their issues collectively, make decisions collectively, and take back public spaces and resources that have been privatized, neglected. Establishing library economies is another example of preferential action, which involves creating spaces where people can freely share their tools, skills, and resources. This can include two libraries, community gardens, and maker spaces. I have a video on library economies on my channel for those curious. Free schools are also a preferential action that prioritize education as a collective and participatory process rather than a top down bank and model style standardized system. Preferential politics also involves creating conflict resolution mechanisms and mutual aid practices. Conflict resolution mechanisms can help communities resolve disputes in a non violent, collaborative way. And mutual aid practices can involve building networks of support and solidarity to meet each other's physical, mental, economic, emotional, and other needs in solidarity without relying on the state or on capitalist institutions. One of the benefits of prefigurative politics is that it allows people to experience the kind of world they want to see in the here and now rather than waiting for some distant future. This can help build momentum and support for the larger social movements and systemic change as people become more invested in their values and principles that underlie the movement. You know, we talk a lot about how do we recruit more people? How do we recruit more people? The way we recruit more people is by bringing them into the fold of, of already existing and already in progress actions. You attract people by showing them that a better world is possible, by inviting them to become a part of that better world and, to invite, and inviting them to take part in shaping that better world. Perfective politics can help provide a sense of hope and possibility in an often bleak and oppressive world. As people see concrete examples of alternative ways of living and working. A solar punk world can only be brought about through action. Stories, not enough. Imagination, it's not enough. We need action. Acts of confrontation, acts of non cooperation, acts of prefiguration, care and know. And that is how we will thrive. If you've ever wondered what the future will look like, whether it will be a dystopian nightmare or utopian dream, I'm here to tell you that the future is what we make it. It's what we do now, in this moment, that will make the difference. Once we take ownership of our future. If you want to thrive in a superpunk world, you have to build it. I have to build it. We have to build it. And now I've spoken about how all of us can contribute to building it around us. But I think it's important to also inquire about how you can build that sort of bunk world within yourself. Don't get me wrong. Of course, lifestyle changes are not going to change the world. So the bunk can be a lifestyle, but it should be much more. Yet still ask yourself, what skills and practices and lifestyle choices can I pursue that can complement this project? For example, so in Puma culture, a design system that aims to create sustainable human settlements and agricultural systems by mimicking the patterns and relationships found in natural ecosystems. It focuses on principles like diversity, interdependence, and regenerative practices, and can be applied to everything from gardening to urban planning. And if you study in permaculture, pick up food preservation. It can involve techniques like canning, pickling, fermenting, and dehydrating and can help to support local food systems and reduce reliance on industrial agriculture. A lot of times, at least in my observation, personal gardens or community gardens, they end up creating these wonderful harvests, right? It's such an overabundance of food. In some cases, it doesn't even get used or it doesn't get fully used. And I think one of the best ways to, you know, make sure that nothing is wasted is through these food preservation methods. If you don't want to get your hands dirty, do it. You could get your hands dirty in the kitchen, you know, ensuring that these foods are able to last. DIY practices are another key aspect of the Soulbank movement. In fact, some consider one of its core principles 
because it emphasizes the need of self-sufficiency, of creativity, and of sustainability. These practices can include everything from repairing and repurposing old items instead of buying new ones, to building your own solar panels or rainwater harvesting systems. This can include everything from building furniture, to brewing beer, to repairing electronics. So you can ask yourself how you can integrate DIY into your everyday life to reduce your reliance on consumer culture. Upcycling is another practice related to DIY, of transforming waste, materials, unwanted products into new and useful items, which can help to reduce waste and promote more sustainable consumption patterns, while also fostering our creativity and resourcefulness. Rewilding efforts are also a crucial aspect of the social movement, as rewilding involves restoring natural ecosystems, reintroducing native species, and allowing nature to take its course with minimal human interference. This can help to combat the effects of climate change, as well as restore habitats and biodiversity that have been lost due to human activity. In solar punk, rewilding efforts are not just about conservation, but also about reconnecting with nature and recognizing our place within the natural world. Ask yourself, what can I do to rewild my immediate spaces? So the punk is not just a future aspiration, but a present reality that already exists in small pockets and communities around the world. You can add to that present reality in your place of life, in your community, in your workplace, in your school and beyond. When we realize that we cannot wait for governments and corporations to make the changes we need to see, we will thrive. When we take action in the present moment, Rather than waiting for some future utopia, we will thrive. Imagine, act, thrive. It's such a potent theme if we truly internalize its implications. Each word flowing from the former and feed it into the latter. We need the power of imagination to inspire us. And with that imagination, through diversity of strategies and tactics, we can act to bring a sort of world to life. And both while the solar punk world has been developed and when it has matured, we can thrive. Solar punk offers a positive vision for the future that is grounded in the power of imagination, the need for action, and the importance of the present moment. It is a vision that recognizes that we can build a world that is both sustainable and just, and that is up to us to make it happen. Through creative and imaginative thinking, we can envision and enact a world where people and the planet are finally thriving. The future is what we make it. So let's make it so